Hi, this is Clyde Woody. I'm your host for Wine 101. Welcome back. It's been uh, quite a while since we've had a new show on. It's, it was quite a, an extended hiatus we took, but we're back for another season. And this time we're taking the show on the road. So we're going to be in the wineries, uh, in wine country, and we're going to be interviewing some winemakers, looking at some of the winemaking processes both in the vineyard and in the winery to help you get a better, better understanding of how this product uh, actually gets to you in the bottle. And uh, joining us for this journey is going to be Scott Sullivan. He's our man in the field. And he's going to do the first set of interviews here in some wineries in Paso Robles in Central California. So we're going to take it out to Scott in the field. Scott, are you there? Thanks, Clyde. This is Scott Sullivan on the road in sunny Paso Robles, California. I'm here at Bianchi Winery with uh, award-winning winemaker Tom Lane. Greetings, salivations. Thanks for having us. Oh, thanks for coming by. It is a beautiful day. You missed the rain yesterday. We got some of the most rain we've had in months here. We got four one hundredths of an inch. And for this time of year, that's good? That's bad. That's no, bad. we are in a drought season. This is the harvest, obviously. A lot of activity around here. Um, and behind us, uh, we have some vines of uh, Zinfandel. And, uh, Indeed we do. I wanted to uh, talk to you about Bianchi and what what they do. Okay, well, yeah, um, the Bianchis um, have really been in the uh, commercial wine business since the early 1970s, and this is the second facility. Um, this is a 40-acre estate. We're standing here in the Zinfandel block. We call it our Zen Ranch. And we also grow Merlot and Cabernet Sauvignon on the far side of the tasting room and Syrah on the other side of the, uh, the winery building there. Um, recently, we planted a four-acre block way back by those, uh, that oak tree over there. Um, and that is Primitivo, which uh, we're going to help to supplement our Zinfandel. Our Zinfandel tends to be a really bright, medium-bodied, fruity wine, and the Primitivo is a little bit darker, not quite so fruity, a little more tannic, so it can uh, be a really nice blender to make a backbone for the, the whole okay. Zinfandel thing. So when you, uh, when you process those, when you're fermenting, do you do that separately and then blend later? I will, yeah. Okay. Yeah, we bring in Oh, 12 or 13 different varieties, and with all the different uh, perturbations of yeasts and fermentation regimes and pressings, we end up with about 60 different lots, which are all kept separately and then blended, you know, within a month of bottling. Wow. Yeah. So is this done? Is there Same as you do with your home wine making, right? Is there a selection committee? I mean, how many people get together and taste and say... Um, this is the final I, mix we're going to do. I put the blends together and uh, the assistant winemaker Todd and our enologist Susan, the three of us will taste, uh, come up with a, two of our favorite and then um, uh, present it to, with the Bianchis and they'll say, yeah, we like them, usually. Okay. <laughs> okay, yeah. And then what, what is the aging uh, regimen that you go through? Once you've, once you've fermented, once the ferment's finished, you're going to go into oak? Yeah, yeah. Why not? A blend? <laughs> Better than walnut. Have you ever had yeah. Asian walnut? Redwood. It's horrible, man. Redwood's a, a little more neutral. It's not too bad, and if it's in big tanks. But yeah, we'll, we'll do oak aging, and it's anywhere from 18 to 36 months, depending on the variety and the year and how tannic it is and how it's developing. Okay. It, it's not any particular recipe, okay. but it, we really go wine by wine and vintage by vintage and vineyard by vineyard, block in the vineyard by block in the vineyard. Okay. Um, for example, if we have a, we, we have clone eight Cabernet Sauvignon, which is a medi more medium bodied Cabernet, one of the older clones. Um, I age that not quite so long and not quite so aggressive a barrel, lower toast levels, whereas clone 337, which is darker and more tannic, I'd leave longer in wood and a little more toasty. Okay, so when you're talking barrel. about toast level, how does that influence the wine, a, a light toast versus say a dark toast? Well, you get um, different flavors. You get more smoky flavors. Um, with the heavier toast and maybe slightly more uh, vanilla, a little more creaminess from the lighter toaster barrels. But I use medium, medium plus in general, and then only heavily toasted barrels in um, Syrah or Petite Syrah. Uh, my wine making style is to make uh, approachable, food friendly wines, you know, mm -hmm. fruit forward with lots of layers of flavors. So, oak to me is a spicing tool that you would get as a mid palate background character. Whereas you'd have the fruit first, and then you'd taste the uh, oak. Or say for in Chardonnay, um, you know you don't want to strain toothpicks out of it when you're drinking it. <laughs> I'm just not a really heavily heavily oaked Chardonnay kind of person. So, but have oak in the background, 
I would put some of it through that secondary process where you can get a little of the butter, a little malolactic fermentation. I'd have a little bit of that in the background too. Again, to get lots of layers of flavors of interest from the nose through the mid palate, late palate finish. Sure. And, and when you're talking about the, the oak and the medium plus or what have you, is this, are you talking about uh, American oak or French oak? Like Zinfandel, I guess it's traditional to use uh, American oak. Uh, whose spicy. tradition would that be, sir? I don't know. I'm asking <laughs> it's you. not mine. I'm asking you, so it's all No, um, we haven't purchased any American oak here since I've been here. Okay. Which is about eight years. Okay. Um, yeah, I tend to get uh, less aggressive barrels, and one of the, our major uh, suppliers is called Dargo and Jeglet, it's a French cooperage that uh, makes a barrel that is not very aggressive. They actually soak the staves in water before they cooper it. Okay. Yeah, it's so, they're so very, a, very so delicate, very nuanced barrels. So a new barrel almost has similar or, or less impact, uh, more like a neutral, perhaps. Yeah, yeah. It just won't go over the head. You know, won't suck your head off with too much oak flavor. I mean, wines made from grapes. I want some grape flavor in there. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. And the, and the growing cycle here in Central Coast, I mean, in Paso specifically. Um, that would be El Paso de Robles. Paso de Robles. Sí. Si. Seguro. Is that a, is that, I know the different varieties uh, change and when they're uh, ripened, but in general, yeah. in a general term, are these, it's a hot climate in the summer, so does that affect uh, earlier harvesting normally or later? What's the normal season or the impact of the climate? Nor so we're usually harvest? starting around my wife's birthday, so, I, you know, I, that's how I do it. it it's uh, September 1st, you know, I, I usually try to put off harvest till after that day to maintain, you know, good relationships with a long-term spouse. <laughs> but, um, so, but other than that, um, and the, in that we get grapes not only from our estate, but we get some fruit from Monterey County and some fruit from uh, Santa Barbara County, which is north and south of us. Um, so, but we still usually start around the 1st of September and it goes through October. The Paso fruit this year, um, Every year is different. There is no mm -hmm. normal. It's, it's, it's interesting. It keeps you from going brain dead. But um, this is a very compressed harvest this year. We started on uh, September 5th, and we, we've only been going about five weeks, and we're going to be done. Oh, wow. We do about 350 tons at this winery, which makes us smallish, um, and we only have two and a half tons left. Oh wow! So, so that's, we're yeah, essentially so that we're was done. short, like you said. Compact. Yeah, it's going to be five to six week harvest. Um, normally, we easily can go ten weeks. So, it 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 creates interesting issues too with tank space and things is, like that. Is it depend year to year, or is there a recipe, say bricks level, or something that you're looking for when you know when to pick? There are a bunch of factors I look at in grapes, and I, I personally go out in the vineyard and decide when to pick. Um, I'm, I'm looking at skin color, skin color all the way down. We have a grape cluster left here. Zinfandel. It's a prop. No, I just broke it off the vine. <laughs> <laughs> um, but if you take a, a grape berry and it's attached there at the pedicel, um, I want color all the way down to there, all the way down to the pedicel. So that's one thing I really look at. Um, I look at um, the seeds in the middle to make sure. Hmm, this is good stuff. You looking for astringence or are you looking I'm for... looking for lack of astringency. Okay. I'm looking for, actually I'm looking for no bitterness. I'm looking for a very dark brown color. And when you bite it, it's really crunchy. Wait, did you hear that? Yeah, I did. <laughs> Good. So th this cluster is um, ripe, it's ready to go. And so seed color, seed texture, um, whether the pulp is adhering to the seed or not, whether you're getting flavor when you bite into it, um, those are more important things to me than sugar. Okay. Um, sugar is what's traditionally used because it's easy to, um, to test for. And the other thing you're looking for acid balance. Um, not only what we call titratable acidity, the mm -hmm. amount of natural acid in the grape, but the other measure of acidity, pH. So I'm looking for those two measures of acidity along with sugar and that imbalance along with seed maturity, pulp maturity, and flavor maturity. And rarely do all those things come at the same time. This year we happened to have a really hot spell in the late summer, yeah. and the sugar jumped really high really quickly. So we let things hang and hang and hang for the flavors to catch up and the seeds to catch up. 
Um, so actually some of the things we've picked this year are uh, in the 27 degree bricks range or about that percent sugar which if you translate that through fermentation into an alcohol level you'll be you know, on the high side. You're going to be 15, maybe 16 percent alcohol. And are, and are you happy with that? You don't, you don't do any adjustment or anything after the fact? Happiness reduce, comes from other things. Than, no. uh, to, redu <laughs> to reduce the uh, al alcohol level at the end? Um, El Paso, I, I, do, I do not, um, I generally do not deal with the uh, sugar level during harvest. Um, some people might ameliorate, Sure. i.e. add water. If you do that then you're, in my way of thinking, you're diluting everything, flavors, you know, all, all the things. So I will go ahead and ferment it out to, an to the natural alcohol level. If at that point the wine tastes hot on your palate, then I will have some alcohol taken out. But at that point you're actually concentrating flavors because you're just taking the alcohol out. So instead of diluting the grape juice, let's concentrate the wine. So we've just finished fermenting our uh, state lakeside ranch uh, Cabernet Sauvignon. Come, coming out of uh, tank number uh, 304, is this Martin? Yes. 304, tank 304 for all of you if you weren't uh, aware of that. Um, these, we've uh, hand shoveled the skins out of the, out of the tank into these, into these bins. Um, we, first we drained off all the new wine and then uh, shoveled out the skins. The skins are going to go up and all the way up into, our, into the press up there. And uh, what we do is we give it one light squeeze at a very light squeezing. It's uh, just two tenths of a bar pressure. And we'll put that off with the free run juice and then we, or the, 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 the juice that just drained out of the tank early on. And then um, whatever is the harder squeeze, we separate that, um, reduce some of the bitterness out that can happen with hard squeeze. And then uh, we'll combine that back in for some backbone in the wine eventually. <laughs> so there we go. Skins are going through the, out of the bin, through the hopper, right down into our uh, tank press. So it's a it's very gentle press. Um, and I, I've written about four different programs for it to do different types of wines. This is a, just a pretty much squeeze it and go kind of program because uh, not a whole lot left after fermenting. We're going to be heading off to uh, the room with all the tanks. Yeah, we call that the tank room here at uh, Bianchi Winery. So we are in the tank room. Um, we have really nice tanks. They're multiple use. They have lots of, lots of, come on, get friendly, get friendly. Get over they have, here. They have lots of doors. They have uh, lots of jackets so we can cool and heat the tanks as, as needed. What, this big old monstrosity you're looking at here is a uh, peristaltic pump. We're using it uh, during a pump over where we take juice off the bottom of the tank put it up on the top in this red fermenter to get the uh, cap or the skins moist again because we want to extract all that good color and flavor out of the skins. So we're taking juice off the bottom, putting it up on the top called pumping over. And that's a, that's a really interesting pump. For those of you engineers, you can think about how a peristaltic pump works. I won't go into it at the moment. And at what temperature do you like to keep? I know it varies, but for this Certainly. particular batch. This is Cabernet Sauvignon, clone 337 from our neighbor. Um, I like it to heat up a little more, so in the cap, up in the skins in the top, we like it to get between 80 and 90 degrees. I keep the juice below 80 degrees. Okay. And uh, that, that way we get a good extraction and a decent punch of tannins. That drying sensation. You know, you want it to, you want it to dry your mouth a little bit, you just don't want it to suck your face off, you know? Here we are inside the barrel room where all the magic happens, at least uh, as far as the aging goes. And uh, Tom, what can you tell me about your barrel room? Um, well, it's full. There's no question thing. about that. We've got about 1,400 barrels in here. Um, we're buying uh, mostly French oak um, from specific coopers, and then we get uh, different coopers for different varieties, actually, and different types of uh, wood from different forests tighter grain, looser grain, and effuse their flavors faster or slower. Um, this happens to be a Merieux barrel, a small cooperage in, Bur in Burgundy, in Bourgogne, as it says here. This is their traditional house toast that we might use in a wine like a Syrah. Um, it's a little bit more aggressive barrel, so, and Syrah is a big red wine and it needs a lot of, uh, needs a lot of oak character to get into it to, to be able to taste it in the wine. Um, 
And also in here today, we have a couple of small lots of uh, fermenting wine in bins. Uh, we have two bins here of Cabernet Franc. It's, uh, there's exactly 1.3 tons in each bin. It it's a very good volume. It's a good mass because it heats up um, into the low 80s on its own. I don't have to chill it. I keep it in this barrel room, which is chilled. Um, it's not too big a mass that would overheat. It's not too small a mass that won't heat up enough. And I've, I've tried fermenting in the smaller bins, in insulated bins, in larger bins, and this single wall bin works really well for me for maintaining your temperature regime. And then we, uh, as those, all those skins rise up, we'll punch those down, get them back down in the juice and even out the temperature. So this is our Cabernet Franc. Two bins, 2.6 total tons. It's one of our smaller lots. Our biggest lot goes up to about a 30 ton fermenter, which we have. This is fermenting Cabernet right now. Probably press that out on Monday. And, and in addition to the grapes, the stock, the root stock that you've selected and everything, there's also different uh, items that you use. For example, the yeast are selected for each grape. Yes. So can you tell us a little bit about this uh, one? Or? This, this strain of yeast, um, ten, um, it gives a more fruity wine. It tends to um, uh, block out some of the vegetal characters. In Cabernet Sauvignon and Cabernet Franc, and that whole family of grapes, including Merlot, Petit Verdot, Malbec, they tend to be on the vegetal side. This is naturally their aroma compounds. So if you want a fruitier wine, you use a yeast that can accentuate the fruity part and not so much the vegetal part. Um, and then if over here, in front of us, there's another different type of yeast over here. We're using a yeast that actually helps keep color in the wine. It's called a Mediterranean yeast. And this is Grenache. And it's in uh, this part of California, generally Grenache is a little lighter colored than the other red. So I'm trying to maintain all that color in the wine. So I'm using a yeast that helps do that. Also, um, there's a natural tannin you can add and it will help um, help keep the color in the wine too. It actually creates uh, bridges and makes nice long polymers of the color for those chemists of you out there. Now we're looking at the cap here. How, mm -hmm. how often do you punch these down? These will be punched down from zero to five times a day depending on where they are in the, in the active ferment. This one is just starting. If you put your hand down here you can feel just a tiny bit of heat coming up now. Where they're over in the Cab Franc, you can feel a lot of heat coming over. So these yeasts are just taking off. We put them in yesterday, they're just getting happy. Um, just starting to produce some carbon dioxide, a little bit of alcohol. The grapes are starting to float to the top. So we'll need to punch this down at some point. And this is my very fancy punch down tool. Very expensive, custom made. French. <laughs> and then um, we would just put it in here and push down and I don't know if you can see this but as we go down you can see bubbles coming up we're releasing the carbon dioxide that's trapped under the cap and um, the hot skins are getting put down into the cooler juice to mix that all up and so we'll go around and do the whole bin we'll also add air while we do this normally to keep the yeast happy Happy yeast make fruity wines. Sad yeast make stinky wines. Do you ever add oxygen in addition to just the action of the punch down? Oh yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, we actively have, we have a, a stainless steel pipe we'll put in here and bubble it up. It's just not set up right now. Okay. Yeah, we'll have that in about an hour at the midday, at the midday punch downs. So this is something I like to do so usually I'm doing this around 7.30 in the morning. I'll do the morning punch downs. It's, it's, a, it's a very zen job, you know? You, you're not trying to break anything. You're just allowing those yeasts to get happy and all that carbon dioxide to evolve. Mm -hmm. and okay, so as we're watching you punch down this cap, I was wondering mm -hmm. what, what do you look at to indicate um, when the fermentation is complete. Um, on each of them, is it for 100% dryness or are there, are there different ones for different batches? Um, my, again, my winemaking style is to press off when the sugar gets down to about 1%. So 
we, we call it degrees bricks and we float a hydrometer in there and it floats lower as you get less and less sugar and when that gets down to zero or a little below zero on that particular scale then we'll take it out and put it in the press. We'll, we'll pump the juice out from under these skins and put these skins straight into the press and go. Okay, um, so you run the juice off first. Yeah, yeah. And then, and then get residual or extra juice off from the pressing that we witnessed earlier. Exactly, exactly. Um, and uh, I, I, I do press off before, as you call dryness, or when the sugar is totally gone. I press off before that because I don't want, at that stage, at the end of fermentation, you're not getting a lot of carbon dioxide evolution, so you can get a lot of air coming in, and you can actually start oxidizing the new wine. It's not protected. So in a very small fermenter like this with lots of space, lots of contact with the air, I would press off just before the yeast are done because the wine is better protected and you'll have a more sound wine later in its life. Um, and so in oak, uh, or even in the bottle, that'll continue to ferment? Uh, to, to dryness after the fact? Or? Um, well, this is what we call the primary fermentation mm -hmm. with yeast. We will press into a tank that we have back there, and what do we call that? Oh, the tank room. The tank room. Um, and, and I'll do the secondary fermentation, which is malolactic fermentation. You know, you're fermenting malic acid and the lactic acid, and that, those bacteria will eat up all the available nutrients and make the line, wine a lot more stable once it's in barrel and no other organisms will, will grow. Hey Clyde, here we are in the bottling room. Um, this is the end of the line for a lot of these wines where they go in the bottle and uh, we're here with uh, award-winning winemaker Tom Lane of Bianchi Winery in Paso Robles. And he's going to talk a little bit about their bottling line and and a little bit about the Bianchis as well. Okay. Um, this idea. is Bianchi Winery. It's owned by the Bianchi family. Um, we are now in the third generation of Bianchis that are doing the day-to-day -day operations. It's uh, third generation's name is Bo. Bo's dad, uh, Glenn, built this facility about uh, 13 years ago. Really nice. He wanted, he wanted to uh, make some wine that he wanted to really drink, and he really liked Chardonnay, so we make a lot of good Chardonnay here. Um, Glenn's dad actually um, uh, acquired a winery back in the early 1970s um, over in the Central Valley. So we, the Bianchis have progressed from Central Valley to coastal and through three generations. So it's, it's a very nice place to work. They've done a really nice job setting up our little winery here. Most wineries our size do not have a bottling line. <laughs> Obviously we do, here it is. Um, you know, usually uh, people bring a truck in and bottle on the truck. Um, we really like having our own line because we can bottle when the wines are ready, not when the truck has time to come to your facility. Which at harvest could be, a, could be a tight fix. <laughs> exactly, and of course, you don't really want to bottle during harvest because you got a lot of time out in the cellar. And you got a lot of yeast floating around, which is not a good idea to have yeast floating around when you're bottling. So here, our bottling line does all the things that are necessary. We rinse the bottles with sterile water. We fill the bottles. We cork the bottles under vacuum. We um, put a capsule on top of the bottle, we put labels on the bottle, and when we're a little sad, we look at our bottling line operator's son's pictures here. So it's a really nice thing. And we have, for a small winery, not only is the having a bottling line a luxury, but we have a loading dock, which may not be impressing, impressive to some people, but it's really nice to have a loading dock. Um, all of our tanks, we can control those from our lab. Um, they're all wired back to the lab. I can also get online and control the temperature of the tanks from anywhere that I'm on the World Wide Web. Oh. And um, we have some really nice soil moisture monitoring in the vineyard, which all that data comes back into the lab, so we know exactly how much moisture is at three different levels on three, three sites on our ranch. So um, that helps us be very conservative with water, which is an issue here in Paso yeah, Robles. Absolutely. So I got to tell you, you know, driving around and going to different wineries in this area this is a beautiful area to come visit, especially if uh, you love wine. Uh, but this property here has its own lake and uh, the uh, quality of service and the disposition of the people here at the tasting room makes it really worthwhile. So I, I want to thank uh, the wonderful people at Bianchi, the Bianchi family, and especially Tom Lane for being our host today. Thank you very Hello. much. Thanks for thinking Bianchi and coming in by and checking uh, us out. It's an easy thought, and this is a wonderful place. You should definitely come out and visit if you can. I also want to let you know that uh, if you like this episode, 
This is the first in several we're going to be doing on the road out here in California. So we would like you to tune to Access 13, and uh, we'll see you down the road.